Hello and welcome to today's event, Setting the Record Straight on Social Media in New Jersey. And this is how the Vineland, New Jersey Police Department manages social media records under Oprah. No, not Oprah Winfrey. She has a lot of power, but the, under the Open Public Records Act. This is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow uh, for government technology. I'm also a recovering state trooper and sometimes media analyst on issues of cybercrime and cyberterrorism. So we want to say thank you for joining us, and I know we're going to have fun over the next 60 minutes. Now, before we begin, just a couple brief housekeeping notes. A recording of this presentation will be emailed to everybody within 48 hours. Now, you can use this recording for your reference. Feel free to pass it along to your friends, people who couldn't attend today. And this webcast is designed to be interactive. Now, you can participate in the Q&A, and I encourage uh, ask us uh, lots of questions. We're going to get to them at the end, I promise. You should see a Q&A box at the bottom left of your presentation panel. Now, send them in as they come up, and we'll address as many as we can uh, during the course of the webinar at the, at the end. Also, if you want to download a PDF of the slides, you can do so by clicking on the Webinar Resources widget at the bottom of your console. Now, also, during today's webinar, you know, connect with LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. I have already launched the first tweet using the hashtag GTLive, so go out there on Twitter, share it with people. I've put the link out there so that they can join us, they can register and attend even right now. So uh, let's make sure we share it with everybody. So right now what we do is we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers, and if you're experiencing any media player issues, we've got a crack team uh, in the chat window ready to answer any of your questions, or visit our webcast help guide by clicking on the help button at the bottom of the console. So now let's get to why we're all here today. Joining me today to discuss this fun and trust me, we'll get a pre-brief. We're talking about a couple good stories that maybe uh, Sergeant Christopher Fulcher will share with us. So one of our speakers today is Sergeant Chris Fulcher, City of Vineland, New Jersey, and Anil Chawla, the Founder and Chief Executive Officer for Archive Social. But before we talk about them, let's talk about the agenda. So we're going to do, we've already done that. Let's set the record straight. I'm going to set the stage first, then Sergeant Fulcher is going to come along, tell you about his experiences, and then Anil is going to come along. It's always great to get the founder and CEO of the company to come on and then talk about real-world examples and solutions, and then we're going to do some live Q&A. So let me kind of kick this off, just in case you thought I was joking about being a recovering state trooper. No, there I am. That's back when I actually had dark hair before it went gray, and Sarge will uh, attest with me. Uh, gray hair is hereditary. You get it from your children and your job. So that's actually me there. I'm a senior fellow for government technology. But really what this is about today, folks, this is nothing more than about ones and zeros. So what that is right there, that's my name in binary code. Because when we start talking about social media, uh, social media archives, records, it is all now to the point of where we're no longer talking about having to photocopy papers. Everything now is becoming digital. So how do you handle this digital world? So first thing I want to do is uh, just welcome you to Vineland. A couple nice pictures there. Uh, you see that city of Vineland. Well, it's something I learned about Vineland, right? It is the home of Welch's grape juice. So if you guys ever have drank Welch's, uh, Mr. Welch, back in the 1800s, late 1800s, created it. Now, of course, this is New Jersey. And look, you can't get away with this for very long. So Tony Sobrano heard somebody was muscling in on the grape juice business. But hey, we got this figured out. So uh, his consigliere now is now the Twitter bird we've taken over. And actually, that is a real bear running through Vineland. I got that out of the picture. So if you guys ever wondered what happens there, lots of stuff. Well, the fun stuff now is what we're going to talk about. So let's talk about three things from a social uh, media standpoint what you have to worry about. Let's do a recon of the landscape. First thing we want to do is let's understand what we're dealing with. Then let's talk about bits, bites, and barristers. How do the lawyers get involved? Because they always do. And then third of all, is it possible to tame the beast? Now let's talk a little bit about from the social media recon standpoint. What has happened that has fundamentally changed this? First of all, you feel like it's hurting cats, and when you do, you feel like, man, it feels like mission impossible. Can I actually really manage this? Can I get this stuff done? I know many of you out there right now are doing screenshots. You're doing, you know, manual captures, and you think, gosh, is it going to get worse? Well, yes, folks, it is going to get worse. Why? Because the iPhone demand is up. When they came out with the 6 and the 6 Plus, Apple is just crushing it with uh, the iPhone. The access to social media, the mobility is going to be driving people's access to government. They're going to want more information. But as with anything, right, what happens? Once you start doing this, then there's the downside, the dark side, as they say, as uh, Darth Vader would say. So uh, now, a couple things to this. Even though it enrages your boss, as it says here in the New York Times, social need is protected, except when it's not protected. And when it's not protected is when the National Labor Relations Board didn't have any sympathy for a police reporter in Arizona who said, what's the matter with you? No overnight homicides? You're slacking, Tucson. Yeah, the newspaper said, yeah, you kind of crossed the line there, so it's protected until it's not protective, didn't re reflect the working conditions. Uh, here's the fun one, though, too. In Illinois, a man with a fake mayor account 
sues the police after the police raided his home when the mayor said, hey, you know, this guy's impersonating me. So a little bit about First Amendment issues. But then, guys, here's the thing. This is where, if you ever want to know where things are going, always read articles written by lawyers uh, because they will kind of predict what's going to happen because it means they're preparing. And this article was written in August of 2012, and it says how deleting a Facebook post may violate free speech and lead to a lawsuit. And what happened? Folks, now this is uh, fast forward a little bit later uh, to, I believe it was in November uh, of 2014. Now the sheriff uh, in San Diego is getting sued because they removed a Facebook page. Uh, They removed their Facebook page after they deleted comments. So what did they say? We're going to sue you. Then what happens? Somebody does it, and then they end up suing them. So what are we going to do? Well, let's talk about can you tame the beast, right? can't have a discussion about social media without having an Internet meme. So can you tame the beast? Well, Grumpy Cat says no. I believe you can, though. And you're going to see between Sergeant Fulcher and Anil Chawla ways to tame this beast. But again, uh, being in the spirit of the Center for Digital Government and Government Technology, we always want to give you a security precaution. Make sure you change your passwords. Keep everything secure, especially on your social media accounts. Forrest Gump didn't do it. It was easy to figure out his password. Yes, it was one Forrest one. You can't, I know I hear the groans even though we're on a webinar, but you've got to have a little fun if you're going to do this in the afternoon. So now let's have a little bit of fun. And now for our show, now the star of our show is going to be Sergeant Fulcher. Sergeant Fulcher has been with the Vineland Police Department for over 18 years, serving the last eight as a supervisor in the services division. He's responsible for the department's 911 center, which means he gets to hear a lot of interesting calls, all the department technology, fleet management, and the citywide radio system. He began his career, though, on the civilian side as a telecommunicator, but has also served as a patrol supervisor and a canine handler. But right before we get to him, we always have a let's do our first poll of the day. And so let's get your guys' opinion. What is your opinion on social media as a public record? How many of you think it is definitely a public record by law? Because remember, Oprah, um, do you think it's a record under Oprah? It might be a record, but your activity isn't worth retaining. Um, You feel strongly that it is not a public record, or you're not sure. Which one of those four do you think it is? There's no right or wrong answer. We just want to get your opinion. Let's see what the poll results are. Wow. Wow. We've done our job already. Everybody thinks it's a public record. Now we're going to find out what you guys are doing about it. So guess what? Sergeant Fulcher, the floor is yours, sir. Have at it. Morgan, thank you very much, and I appreciate your opportunity here to speak and uh, talk about this. My name is Sergeant Fulcher from the Violent Police Department in New Jersey. As Morgan said, we're a rather busy rural department. We serve an area that covers over 69 square miles. In New Jersey, that's the largest land area uh, in the state that we cover. We have 145 sworn, about 25 civilian personnel, and we handle about 65,000 calls for service a year. And this is just to kind of put it in perspective for some of the other departments that are out there. We're certainly not the largest, um, but we're definitely not the smallest either. We started our introduction, I guess, into social media back in 2011. Uh, We recognized the need to start using social media as an avenue to push information out, to engage with the community, to get some information out that would, wouldn't otherwise be given as quickly or as easily as social media can handle. Uh, we added a YouTube channel, a Pinterest, and a Flickr account later on, and we started finding right away that we were getting a lot of response and we were getting a lot of following. Uh, it was easy to push out some quick and easy information just about what was going on around town, We use uh, our Twitter account, like many other departments do, just to kind of warn people that there's a collision and to stay away from a certain area, some missing person information, some wanted person information. But we're also really using it in our community policing and our juvenile aspects to really enhance our public outreach, to let people know what's going on with the police department, what other events we're holding, and what else we're doing. And we saw a lot of success. We actually saw a little bit more success, I think, maybe than we expected. Uh, the Twitter page so far has about 60 followers. We've sent over 5,000 tweets. Facebook page averages about 100 or so visits a day, uh, 1,200 likes average per week, and about 1,700 people uh, that we've actually engaged. And it may sound like low numbers, but we're again, we're not a huge town. Um, our population is somewhere between 60 and 65,000. Uh, we're kind of, if you think of South Island or South Jersey, Violent is kind of directly in the middle between Philadelphia and Atlantic City. So we're just far enough away to be a, a suburb, not quite big enough to be a city. So for as 
interested as we were in social media and for as quickly as we adopted it and as quickly as everyone else adopted it, things were great. And just like everything else, things are great till they're not great anymore. And we had a quick following. We had a lot of support with this from our police administration to our city administration, and everybody was engaged. But there were a lot of things that we didn't have, and we didn't have any kind of an archival system in place. We didn't have any kind of a backup. We didn't have any kind of a method for storing any posted pictures, messages, posts, comments. We didn't really have any method of doing any of that. And we thought about it, and we thought, you know, we, we recognize these are more than likely public records. And our city solicitors we had conversations with, and everybody recognized that there was a potential that this was going to become an issue. But time went on. Nobody asked for a whole lot. And the things that people did ask for, we could quickly and easily put together and give out. And I think we may have handled, I would say, a half dozen maybe OPA requests, uh, Open Public Record Act in New Jersey. That's the equivalent of a FOIA request. We may have handled a half dozen of them up until the end of March. And unfortunately, at the end of March, we had an in-custody incident that occurred. And what happened after that is because of, well, not because of, but with social media, our department unfortunately became public enemy number one. And everyone was starting to use social media to post lots and lots of messages, lots and lots of information. Uh, we had anonymous groups that were getting together and making videos and trying to push a lot of information our way. We had our network administrators keeping an eye on our network. We were having millions and millions. Our network was being tagged and hit millions of times in an hour just because of the information that had gotten out regarding the incident and some of the people's opinions and feelings of it. We saw a tremendous increase in our network traffic. Uh, our Facebook posts and messages, those, that traffic also significantly increased. Um, and I'm looking back now at some of the information that we have through our social media archive back in April, which was when this incident occurred. Looks like we were running over 1,200 records. Uh, just to give you a comparison, in June, we had about 400. So that's the difference between what we saw in terms of the, the traffic and the information that was generated to our site. And it was all of our sites. It was Facebook, it was Twitter, it was pretty much everything we had. All of our OPA requests tripled. All of a sudden, people were very interested in what was going on on the site, what was going on with the department, and everybody kind of wanted their piece of to see you know, the behind the scenes or what they thought we weren't putting out. At the time, everything was going out. We learned very quickly we weren't going to be able to continue that. We had some, we had some posts that we have a, a best standards and a best practice policy. A lot of those posts weren't meeting and weren't um, being upheld to that policy. So we would try to take them down. We would try to remove them. But we had some legal opinions that said that may not be the best way to handle it and that it may be a little bit better to block all the posts completely. So after a long discussion about it, that's exactly what we did. We recognized that all, because of all this information that was going on these sites, we needed a way quickly to back up, store, and retrieve all this content. We needed a way to organize it, and we needed a way to respond to all these different requests in a much more efficient manner than what we were doing. And we needed some sort of a procedure to quickly respond to all these recurring requests. So once we started blocking all these messages, um, we just changed some settings in Facebook so that all posts and comments were blocked, and that way we were kind of handling things consistently. But people realized that, and they saw that they weren't being posted, so they started making the OPA requests wanting to see these comments. And because they're comments on the page, even though they're not being posted, they are open for public inspection and for public record. So we had some monthly requests that were coming from the same person at the same time, and it was an incredibly tedious process to have to go in, open up each post, expand it, copy and paste it, and then move it into a document so that we could release it. And I did that, wound up doing that for a good four or five, well, I would say four months. Afterwards, we said there's got to be a better way to do this. We've got to have a more efficient way of handling these requests and responding to them. So we started looking around. We found a product that has been incredibly time-saving and efficient for us, backing up all of our social media records now. But to me, it, it's not so much the backup of the records that's important because of my 
my role and my responsibility, it's the retrieval and the presentation of the records that's probably even more important to me than the backup. And I recognize you can't respond and you can't produce them if you don't back them up, but backing them up, I think we could have done that easily. Being able to archive them, being able to search them, being able to put them and present them out in an orderly timeline is what's far more important. So the system's worked very, very well for us so far. Uh, we've been able to archive all these records and retrieve them and push out the reports that we need to, and it's really, really saved us a lot of time. That's pretty good, Sarge. Is there anything else you want to close out on before we go into uh, the next part? Of the, I mean, it sounds like you really had that FOIA request for the in-custody death was kind of a game-changer for you guys. It, it really was. That was kind of the incident when really what happened was our social media uh, footprint kind of tripled at that point. You know, we were out there, people saw us, they knew we were there, but with this incident and with the attention that the incident drew, all of a sudden we didn't just have a regional or a small regional following, we all of a sudden had a national following. And with that came a lot more posts, came a lot more information. Yeah, and I think Anil's going to cover that. So, hey, look, great job, appreciate it. Um, he's going to stick around, folks, so keep your questions coming in. We've got some questions, folks, and this is great. We've got over 90 people on the line right now. This is terrific because you guys know how important this information is. So what we're going to do is, uh, before I read uh, Neil's bio, let me, uh, let's go to the next poll question here because now, first of all, we talked about do you think it's a record? Now to Sergeant Fulcher's point, how are you doing this? So let's, let's find out how you folks now are currently retaining your social re uh, media records, re records of social media. So first one is we're not retaining our records and rely on the networks. That means Twitter, Facebook, etc. We take manual captures, and that's painful if you do it, but if you do it, we take manual captures, screenshots, copy and paste, just as Sergeant Fulcher was saying. You use a personal backup tool. There are examples out there like Backupify, SocialSafe, things like that. You use an automated solution for archiving. And then the bonus question of the day, are, are any of you out there already a happy archive social customer? So let's see what was there. 71% are saying that you're relying on the network. And I think what you're going to find is over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes when Anil shows you this stuff, you're going to see not only why that's such a huge liability for you, but you're going to see some solutions to it. Some of you take manual captures. Again, a lot of time-consuming things. So but let, me, let me start off now by uh, talking about Anil Chawla. Anil is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. Now, it's a civic tech company that specializes in archiving social media for public records requirements. Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina in 2010 to launch the world's first open interactive social or archive social of social media. Since then, Archive Social has worked with hundreds of government entities, such as the city of Austin, state of North Carolina, and folks, the granddaddy of them all, the U.S. National Archives, to ensure long-term transparency for government and social media communications. Folks, and we know... Uh, we're talking about records that paper records that might not exist, you know, 50 years from now. Social digital media is going to last forever. And in fact, Archive Social did such great work, they were selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013 and recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government by the leading analyst firm Gartner. So, Anil, it sounds like this is teed up for you and you've got your work cut out for you. I sure do. Thank you so much, Morgan. I appreciate the intro there, and I appreciate all of you who have carved out uh, this time on your busy Tuesday to attend this webinar. Uh, with over 90 attendees, it really shows how important this topic is and how it's a rising topic, which is what we've seen as we've moved across the country. Uh, more and more interest in New Jersey around social media as a record and mitigating that legal risk. And of course, I have to thank Sergeant Fulcher for sharing your story with us. Uh, I think we can all see that Vineland, Vineland uh, town of Vineland is uh, essentially, or it's, it's, it's a town that's uh, a modest-sized town, and the presence that they have there is pretty typical for agencies across the country. And having resources around social media to moderate and maintain and respond is often a challenge. Uh, and so I think it's great for us all to learn from the actions that, that Sergeant Fulcher and his team have taken in Vineland to mitigate their risk, react to this incident that happened, to put the appropriate systems in place, so that they are now prepared for future, future occurrences in a way that won't be a distraction to the agency. So thank you again for sharing your story. Now, as Morgan alluded to, my goal here is to actually provide you with some solutions. That poll that we just saw was pretty typical for what we see across the country. About 70% of folks are relying on the social networks today for their record keeping. 
I am really encouraged to see that about a third of you are also uh, performing manual screenshots today because having some record is better than no record. What I intend to do here in the next 20 minutes or so is I want to share first a few more real-life examples and case studies around social media as a record. We heard the story from Sergeant Fulcher receiving the OPA request uh, for their Facebook content, which was being hidden. That's not the only case that we've heard about. We've heard about a bunch more, and some of those may resonate with you, so I want to share them with you first so that you can see what's happening in terms of a legal landscape. And then what I want to do is share with you a handful of different record-keeping uh, options. We at Archive Social do provide archiving software, but we're not the only solution out there. There are different approaches that you can take as an agency based on your own needs and your budget and your environment. I want to walk through four or five different options for you based on your needs so that you have some action item coming out of here if you are one of the 70% that uh, needs some kind of record keeping. With some time permitting, I think we're doing good on time today, so I want to share a brief demonstration of the Vinyl PD archive so that you can actually see how this technology works, how, the, how Sergeant Fulcher's agency is prepared now to be able to react and produce that information as needed. And of course, I'm here to answer your questions. I know Sergeant Fulcher is as well. So as questions arise, we do encourage you to use the Q&A window. Uh, enter your questions, and we'll definitely come back to those at the end. Now, I know we had a, a previous poll uh, at the beginning of this webinar about social media being a public record, and I was really, really amazed and happy to see the response to that poll. Uh, I think it was 100% of the respondents felt that social media is a public record. That's not what we typically see. Uh, we do see that most people think it's a record, but there is some confusion around it. And one of the reasons why there is confusion about social media being a record or, or not a record, I, I suppose, is, is the other viewpoint, is that there hasn't actually been a whole lot of legal change across the country in, in states around the country, and specifically in, in New Jersey, to, to come out and call social media as a record. Now, the good news here is that uh, for us in this discussion and the action that violence has taken, is that we don't need to legislate this. This is actually a part of the law as it exists. If you look at the o OPRA uh, definition for a record, you can see that it already describes records as information that's stored or maintained electronically. That's a pretty broad definition there, uh, which of course would cover email, social media, and other forms of electronic communication. And it's this type of definition that we see across the country, why agencies and records bodies and authorities around the country are treating social media as a record. I'm glad that everyone uh, that responded to the poll felt the same way. That gives us the legal context uh, from a definition standpoint. Well, let's look at what kind of content is uh, actually tra uh, transpiring across social media to constitute a record. But oftentimes, the question that we get from an agency is, sure, I see social media, uh, by definition, potentially creating public records, but what we do on social media is not going to create records or it's not creating records. And I really want to challenge that notion here today. Um, because the nature of social media is that it connects you with your citizens, connects you with your audience, and gives you this real-time platform to inform the public and have that information shared naturally through, through viral effects. A perfect example of when, when you can use social media effectively is during an emergency. We've seen that happen time and time again in the last several years. Uh, and, and perhaps the, the most prominent example of that uh, is the Boston Marathon bombings. When the bombings happened, Virtually every news agency in the world turned to the Boston PD Twitter feed, and the Boston PD decided to use that Twitter feed as a primary source of getting information out uh, efficiently and effectively. And it was very clear how the content that was coming across that Twitter feed was important. Uh, in fact, a, a trivia fact here is that when, when the Boston PD finally captured the terror suspect, the very first announcement of capturing the suspect was actually a tweet. It wasn't a press release, it wasn't a tip to a journalist, it was simply a tweet across their Twitter feed. And that really speaks to the power and importance of social media. Now hopefully uh, those of you who are on the line today will never experience a tragedy of that magnitude, but you of course have emergencies, you have natural disasters um, in your jurisdictions, and social media is a channel that you want to be able to use but also be protected um, after that emergency because everyone knows after an emergency or a crisis what you get are a flood of public information requests. I'm going to pause there just for a second. Uh, Morgan, I, we're getting some, some music on the line here. Uh, I think somebody put us on hold, Anil, so I'm going to track them down and say if you're going to put us on hold, okay. at least play something nice. We'll find it out. Okay. It's, uh, it's a calming music for sure uh, as we look at some of these examples. Now, if we step back from emergencies and we look at more of the day-to-day, -day, uh, hopefully you're not having a whole lot of emergencies. Day-to-day, -day, uh, if you think about government agencies and the purpose of a government agency, I, I personally at least believe that 
the, 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 the foundation of government and the purpose of every government agency is ultimately to serve the citizens, and that social media is a perfect embodiment of that. So if you're on social media, you have that Twitter feed, you have that Facebook page, it's not just about posting content out in one-way direction, it's about having a two-way conversation, and you're going to get citizen feedback. So this is definitely an area we, where we do see records being created. And I want to give you an example. This is, this is an absolute random example that I picked off of Twitter just doing some searches that I think on the surface may not strike you as an important record, but if you look at the characteristics of this conversation, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. Uh, essentially, a, a woman in Texas was trying to reach the Texas DOT uh, she couldn't get through, so she started uh, over the phone. So she started tweeting to them to say that, "Hey, I can't call your phone number." They had initially told her that, that perhaps the phone lines were just busy, and ultimately she determined that the phone number that the Texas DOT printed out uh, on a mailer was actually incorrect. And so she was able to determine this this problem, this misinformation, reported back to the Texas DOT, and allow them to correct this issue. And this all transpired across Twitter. Now again, this, this seems fairly uh, a fairly simple incident. It doesn't seem like there will be some kind of legal consequence around this. But this is a situation where a citizen noticed a, a, an error and was able to inform the agency and provide that feedback, and certainly as a record. This is the kind of stuff that happens day in and day out, citizen customer service. And it does create records, and uh, you know, in the basis of, of legal record keeping and open records requests, is that you never know what you're going to get the records request for. So you need, do need to think about your social media presence as a place that you're going to create records because you're doing useful things on that presence. So the next question that I get often is, okay, so I can see how what I'm doing on social media may be creating records, but it's out there on Twitter and Facebook. Do I really need to worry about this? Uh, and is anyone even asking for it? We already heard from Sergeant Fulcher that, that records requests are happening, They're happening there in the state of New Jersey for social media content. Here's a very, very clear example of a records request actually coming out from the other side of the country, the state of Washington, where a citizen in Seattle um, made, a, uh, made a comment on, on Twitter to the Seattle PD about the information that they were auto-posting. So basically the Seattle PD has a, a set of feeds where they auto-post police incidents um, to keep the citizens informed. And the citizen noticed that some of those, those Twitter feeds seemed to be delayed or missing information. So we actually tweeted at the Seattle PD about this, and then a few tweets then said, actually, I just want the archives of all of your Twitter feeds, um, and please consider this a public records request. In effect, the citizen made a public records request for social media using social media. So it's really a sign of the times that, that this happened. Now, the Seattle PD said, wait a minute, um, you can't just make a uh, public records request to us via tweet. You do have to fill out our, our web form for public records requests. But yes, what you're asking for is public record, and we will, we will work to produce it. Give us three weeks. Um, so again, the question is, if this came in for you, and it was about information that was either missing from your Twitter feeds or could no longer be located, um, how would you go about producing uh, content that you had previously posted out on your social networks, and how long would it take you? Now, that's a very, very contrived specific example. It's a real example, but um, what we're seeing more often is that not, folks are not specifically asking for Twitter and Facebook content, but they are ask, making public records requests that do cover Twitter, Facebook, and other social media content. So if you've never received a, a, social, a public records request or an OPA request for Twitter or Facebook or social media, you may have received a request that started with this kind of language. Any and all documents, all reports of the incident, all emails and communications. And it may be something like all emails and communications that are related to the street closure, as you see on the slide. That's a request that, if you, if you look back at your social media presence, what we're seeing more often than not is that social media is uh, involved in that discussion and, and that promotion of information. And so you really do need to think about responding to those requests uh, in a complete fashion by responding with this information. And finally, what I want to do is give you just a few case studies. So we've talked about social media being a record, how what, what you're doing on social media is probably creating records, how you may even be receiving public records requests today. Why is it important to take action proactively rather than reactively? Uh, so I have a few, few case studies here to cover. Uh, the first is with the Honolulu PD. And in fact, this is a case study that, that actually does not involve public records, but it, it speaks to something that we see happening uh, each and every day on government social media. Basically, the Honolulu PD was receiving postings from a, from a, 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 a pro-gun group, uh, an interest group, um, that was expressing their opinion on this important issue. And they felt that those comments were not relevant, and in some cases they may have felt that they were somewhat offensive. And so they removed that content. This group then turned around, they're an interest group, and they filed a lawsuit uh, alleging that they had a First Amendment freedom of speech right to express their opinion on this important topic. 
in that lawsuit, they asked the Honolulu PD to produce records of um, all of their social media postings that had been removed and also reinstate them. Now, this never was set, this was never ruled upon in court. Uh, the Honolulu PD, the city of Honolulu, actually settled the case by just paying thirty thousand dollars in attorney's fees, uh, and actually changed their social media policy such that they won't moderate anymore. Um, so it's an, a sort of an unfortunate outcome. Uh, but what it really brings to light is, if you're a government agency, um, public records or not, what you're doing on social media does matter. Uh, and as a government agency, you are unfortunately a target of litigation. And if you are brought to court, especially in regards to something you've already deleted, how do you tell your side of the story if you haven't kept records? Record keeping has to be there in order for you to, to tell your side of the story uh, and be in a legal situation to be able to defend yourself. Because if you don't have the records, you can't even start to defend yourself to tell your side. So it's an interesting case. Um, again, it brings up issues around comment moderation, which is uh, a little out of scope of our discussion here today. I will say that we at Archive Social do support agencies' ability to moderate comments. We just recommend that you have a very clear social media policy, and you're very strict in terms of how you enforce that policy. If you do need a social media policy that covers comment moderation, that's a free resource that we provide. So at the end of this uh, webinar, you can feel free to reach out to me. Now, that's a case that was that gained national attention, but we at Archive Social also see quite a lot happening in our own customer base now that we've worked with hundreds of agencies across the country on this issue. So I want to cover a few of you very briefly just to give you an insight into how social media can be a record and how these agencies, by acting proactively, really mitigated their risk and prevented um, you know, an incident from bringing down their social media or even bringing down their department in a, in a, cost, in a cost perspective. So, this first incident is in, uh, out of South Florida where a police department was, again, was trying to do their job. They had learned about a local company that was potentially a scam. They were told this by a local law firm, so they trusted the information, and then they posted it out on their social media feeds. Well, as you might uh, imagine, the company didn't quite agree with being called a scam, and so they came back and told the police department to remove those postings, which the police department did. And then the company came back once again and filed a lawsuit and said that you've defamed us as a company, it's hurt our business, um, we're, we're, we're suing you, and as part of the discovery, we want you to produce records of, of everything you said about us being a scam, including the content we already told you to delete. Now, this is obviously a sticky situation, um, but starting with, with this, this lawsuit, the first thing they have to do is produce the records. Fortunately, this city has been archiving their social media. They're able to turn around the records right away, which is a really good thing, because if they're not able to, to even you know, fulfill that initial legal request, Again, that puts them on the wrong foot going into this legal situation. Now, across the country, another police department, again, doing their job, this time not even going out of their way, but really just doing what they're, what they're actually um, supposed to be doing, which is help support the city's uh, programs. The city had a gun buyback program, um, and so this is something they had to do. They had to participate in, um, and they had to share information about it. And they had... Um, Posted information about this gun buyback program, again, a controversial issue which led to an explosion of comments on social media. And it turns out that the NRA comes in and, and requests that information, actually filed a public information request for everything that, that the city and the police department had posted in relation to that gun buyback program. Uh, and fortunately, this department had just started a free trial of our product, and three weeks in they received this request, so they're able to use our product to produce it. Um, but the officer over there told us that he was sweating bullets. Um, if he didn't have some kind of record keeping in place, he would have uh, had to have spent hours upon hours scrolling through his feeds, uh, and he was, he was pretty certain that he wouldn't have been able to get everything back in, in response to his records request. And finally, um, in Spokane, Washington, again, this is another government technology case study that we can provide. Uh, this is an incident that's even even simpler than the two that I described. This is just a city posting about local events, like practically every city in town does. And so they were promoting a helping promote a local a kayaking trip. Unfortunately, somebody died on that kayaking trip, and the plaintiff's family filed a lawsuit asking for all social media postings related to that event. And the city had to to go through two years of content actually to to produce that information for that legal discovery. Again, they were archiving. No problem. They produced the information. Life moves on. Um, this is what happens in government. Uh, you play an important role in people's lives, um, which means you, litigation is something that government gets involved with. But what we, we don't want is this to be backbreaking for you. And so these cities are all examples of areas that were proactive that um, were able to produce that information and move on and actually continue to grow their social media presence. So how do we arm you to do the same if you're not keeping records today? 
Well, the first tip that I'll give you, um, unfortunately, 70% of you are relying on the social network today. Um, unfortunately, that's not a long-term strategy. Uh, no matter what you choose to do, I strongly advise you to leave this webinar today thinking about what your record-keeping approach is going to be. Um, the reason why you can't rely on Facebook and Twitter is very much the same reason why you can't rely on um, you know, one of your staff members' email inboxes being your email archive. That information can be removed, and when it's removed, it's gone forever. The problem with social media that it's actually a lot worse than, so, than email is that this content doesn't actually sit on your own computer. It, already, it sits out there on Facebook and Twitter. So by default, you have absolutely no control of it. It's out there on some other server. And if it's deleted, um, whether you delete it or a citizen deletes their comments or messages to you, it's gone forever, and there's no way to re recoup it. In fact, Facebook has information on their site about how law enforcement agencies can submit subpoenas if, if you have a records request. But if anything has been deleted, they can't help you. So you have to get this information in your control. In fact, in many states, states have come out with a guidance uh, advising local agencies that this is their, is your responsibility as a local agency to have this information in your control. How do you do that? Well, you can start with how 30% of our audience has started, which is with manual archiving, taking screenshots, copy and paste. Uh, the great thing about this is that it's all, you know, in a physical sense, it's free. The problem is that when you take screenshots of content on Twitter and Facebook, it's really hard to have complete information. There's this, uh, this is, there's this concept of metadata that you have to be aware of. Um, and a really good way to explain that is to show you a tweet. Uh, metadata is basically the technical data that's associated with that communication that you don't see, but it describes that communication. So if you look at a tweet, in this case, a 126 character tweet, um, when you take a screenshot, all you will get is 126 characters. But that tweet actually has more than 2,000 characters of metadata, information about who posted it, timestamps, location information, what Twitter client was used. That metadata is actually the full electronic record. When your agency is archiving their email, which you're probably already doing, you're getting that full record. So with social media, you want to think about it the same way. How do you get that full electronic record? Um, there's actually case law around the country about metadata being a part of the public record. So for one, doing, doing screenshots will get you the content, which is a good starting point, but it doesn't get you the entire electronic record. It also may seem like it's free uh, because it doesn't cost you any kind of procurement, but it's not actually free from, from, from a time perspective and a resources perspective. Over time, you will spend lots of hours doing this. It's difficult to manage and organize this information. And ultimately, if you've spent months or years keeping screenshots, it's incredibly difficult to find what you're looking for within a screenshot. Uh, and finally, um, there isn't a whole lot of authenticity to, uh, to a screenshot because uh, anyone can Photoshop anything today. Um, so it's not a long-term record uh, keeping strategy. It's great that a lot of agencies are doing this. It's, it's a perfect starting point. I would strongly recommend it to you if you're not doing anything at all because especially if you're moderating content, you do want to have a record of what you've removed. It's a good starting point, but again, it's very, very difficult to manage in the long run. Uh, and as we know, Oprah and public records requests do span several years. So a much better approach is to look at automation. Now, several years ago, in about 2008 onwards, uh, a few backup tools emerged, um, including Backupify and later SocialSafe and some others that you may have heard of. These are tools that actually came out in the consumer space for individuals to back up their own social media. Again, recognizing that the social networks have the data, and we as people and organizations don't have our own data. Uh, really great concept to have these tools, but they are very simple backup tools designed for individuals and not government record keeping. So what they will do is they'll provide a very, very basic capture of social media. If you look at my screen right now, you'll see that uh, I have a screenshot. This is actually a Facebook wall out of Backupify um, with status updates and comments. Those status updates and comments are actually in the same conversation, but you really can't figure that out because this is a really basic capture. Um, so these backup tools will do a very bare minimum capture of the content. Social is a little bit better in their presentation, but they store that data locally on your, on your computer, so you have to then back that up somehow. Very, very simple solutions. Um, to get started, they do automate the record keeping process, but they're not really designed for archives and for producing uh, information during public records requests. So the search capabilities are also very limited. Again, if you have a very limited budget, you know, if you're looking at spending under uh, $50 a year, um, this may be a place to start, but that's you know, the level of record keeping that you will get. So where, where I would really encourage you to look to move to uh, at some point is true archiving, whether that's with us or another vendor. Um, archiving is something that's important. Um, you've had it in place with email. It's, it's important for your social media, as we've seen with Sergeant Fulcher today. Um, now, I want to talk to you about a class of archiving solutions out there called all-in-one archiving. These are 
solutions that started out in the email archiving space or the web archiving space, and they started to bring social media into the mix. You should absolutely, you should absolutely evaluate these solutions, um, but you should also understand what they're doing. So some, some of these solutions are, are better than others, um, but what you should look for in, in comparing these solutions with each other is how are they treating that data? If social media is a secondary type of content in an email archive, is it being chopped up into email? Are you losing data? How do you re repiece together the conversations, especially as a Facebook conversation gets chopped up into multiple emails? How do you work with that data if it's being pulled into an archive that wasn't originally designed for social media? So those are the kinds of things you want to look for as you evaluate archiving solutions that have been on the market that have supported other types of content. Social media is a bit of a different beast because it's interactive uh, and it's rich with multimedia. So you want to evaluate these solutions, but think about how, does, how, do, how do you ultimately have a true social media record that you can have peace of mind in. And ultimately, that's where, where I would encourage you to look, is whether you're looking at uh, a vendor that does more than just social media or that's specifically focused on social media like we are. How do you do this in a way that truly protects your agency? Uh, and, and in that regard, I want to leave you with four criteria to think about. One is frequency. Because this data is completely outside of your control, it sits on Facebook and Twitter, and it can be lost at any time, you want to get it into your control as frequently as possible. As content's posted, you want to get it into your hands um, and make sure that's protected. How frequently does your archiving solution capture the content? Comprehensiveness, because this information is broadcast in public, it's better to have more than less. Again, if you go into a legal situation, you want to be able to tell your side of the story. Do you have both sides of the conversation? Do you have that metadata that I talked to? Um, how good is your record? Authenticity is about being able to actually utilize that writ record in a legal situation. So if it's a tweet or a Facebook comment, can it serve as legal evidence? And how does your archiving solution actually allow it to serve as legal evidence? What protections does it apply so that you can prove that someone didn't Photoshop it or type it up in Notepad, that this was a true record that you captured so that nobody can dispute it? And then context, which I believe is the most overlooked aspect in archiving, um, mostly because vendors like to focus on how you store data, but as Sergeant Fulcher said, it's really about retrieval. How do you make sense of that information? How do you locate it, make sense of the information when you need it? Can you uh, reconstruct a Facebook conversation from five years ago that has 100 comments on it? Can you replay a Twitter feed? How easily can you do that? And again, typically solutions that are designed for social media do this better than those that are all in one that are sort of throwing social media into the mix. So you do want to evaluate that. Um, and ultimately, when you have a social media archiving solution in place, then you can easily capture, uh, manage, and produce records, uh, have the peace of mind that your agency needs so that you can continue to grow your social media and serve your citizens without worrying about legal situations being a roadblock for you. Now, if you want to see how this is done, um, a number of, of, of municipalities around the country ha and other government agencies have worked with us to launch open archives. So you can actually go and visit one of their open archives. Snohomish County is a really interesting example because they had a landslide last year, as many of you know, on the state of Washington. And they had been archiving with us, and they use social media for their emergency response. And you can actually go back and replay that emergency run response on their open social media archive. And um, they, had re they did receive a number of public information requests, and they were able to use this open archive to respond. Um, and then there are other agencies like the state of North Carolina, the city of Austin, that have launched open archives that you can check out on your own. What I actually want to do now, uh, because we have some time here just for a few minutes, is share a live demonstration with you. So I've got my contact information on the screen just for the moment in case you want to reach out to me. Happy to be a resource to you in any way. Uh, and as the screen share comes up, what I'm going to demonstrate to you is actually the archive um, for, for Vineland PD. Um, Sergeant Fulcher mentioned they had that big spike of, of activity in April um, with uh, death in custody. Um, and you can kind of see that happening here. But what I want to focus on are those four criteria that I explained, those things that you want to look for, those four pillars of a, of, a, of a great social media archiving solution. In order to do that, I'm actually going to dive straight into the search interface. As we said, this is all about retrieval. So if you as an agency have a public records request or legal situation, how are you going to find that content? Well, Vineland today has an archive that's automatically capturing this social media as it's happening throughout the day. And anytime they need to find something, they can drill down based on a variety of criteria. They can search based on time range, they can search all of their social media presence, given that they're on several social networks, or they can drill down and identify the content they're looking for. Perhaps it's just the Twitter content. They can look for specific keywords. They can even look for content from specific citizen or content you know, directed to a specific social networking account that they're archiving. They've got a lot of granularity here. But how does this tie into the four criteria? Well, let me go ahead and run a search, and you can see exactly what I mean when we talk about uh, criteria such as context and authenticity. 
A true social media archiving solution will actually recreate, replay that social media content the way that you see it on the social network. So if we drill down right now to some of the wall posts um, in the search result, again, we have more than 18,000 records, you can see that a social media archiving solution now has the ability to replay that content with all the text, the images, the links that you're used to seeing um, on, on Facebook itself. You can see that there's a large comment there. Um, there's comment threads that you can expand out, for example. So this, this post had a number of comments on it, and you can expand that out. That context is incredibly important for helping you make sense of your records over time. Now that context is one of the pillars. Another one that I mentioned that's pretty interesting is authenticity, and we talked about metadata. So I want to give you just a, a real example of that. If you look at the Twitter content in this archive, um, you'll see that uh, you know we have a variety of re results here. This is a pretty short tweet with an image attached to it. You know, a social media archiving solution should be able to deal with that rich content and provide that that rich imagery. But also from a from a from an authenticity standpoint, we have to be able to get to that metadata. And what you can do with a solution like Archive Social is you can access that metadata. Again, a very short tweet with an image on it. This is how much metadata is behind that tweet. All sorts of information about user IDs and timestamps and, and information about that electronic message. Um, this should be available at your fingertips to be able to, to fulfill that authenticity requirement. And of course, comprehensiveness uh, and, and frequency are, are not as easy to demonstrate to you, but these are things, again, to think about as this, com this conversation and this information is being captured throughout the day. The last thing I'll leave you with um, is when you are doing a public records request, it's often a needle in a haystack. Um, and so if we bring this back out, I have the full archive here, nearly 19,000 records now in Violin's archive. Being able to find that needle is a challenge. So you want to think about how your solution can facilitate that. In our case, we could, for example, drill down. We could drill down and say, what we're really looking for are comments on photos um, that were for Violin PD, and perhaps they happened in December 2014. So having that ability to really narrow the search in an archiving solution is really, really important. Ultimately, you can find what you're looking for. We know we have a lot of positive comments here for, for Vineland PD. Being able to then find that needle in the haystack, again, this is social media. You still need that full context. You found the needle, but you need that context. So being able to replay that conversation back out with all the imagery uh, and comments on it, and then being able to turn that into a PDF or some other format, that's ultimately what you need. Um, to really be able to respond effectively and efficiently. This is the kind of technology that I encourage you to seek out, whether that's with us or another archiving vendor, but it can really protect your agency, um, as you've heard from Sergeant Fulcher today. So with that, Morgan, I know we've got uh, just over 10 minutes left for, for questions. I want to hand it back to you. Well, hey, guys, this is fantastic. And let me tell you what's fantastic about this is that um, this is real-world stuff. We've got a lot of questions in there, folks. Keep them coming. This is real-world stuff dealing with real-world issues. Um, being a former detective, state trooper, I dealt with in-custody uh, death issues. Uh, we dealt with homicide investigations. You guys know in the old days how much paper there was involved. Now we add social media. So uh, I think this is a great discussion at the right time. We actually have quite a few things uh, teed up here now. You guys, a lot of you asked, yes, uh, this recording will be available. Uh, in 48 hours, we'll give everybody a link. But, hey, let's start jumping into some of these uh, questions here because I think we've got a lot of good ones here. And the first one we get here is from uh, Anthony uh, Curitan, I believe, Bergen County Sheriff's Office. Wants to know if you remove somebody as a friend on Facebook, is there repercussion? Uh, you know, maybe they won't like you anymore. But I also think, uh, you know, is there if, – if you have friends, I think we're probably getting to the page there, Anil and Sergeant Fulcher. If somebody's a friend on your page and remove them, any issues there, any consequences you see when they're a friend of the official page? Morgan, I'll take it first. The, the way we have our page set up is we don't actually have – it's not a friend page. Uh, we've got it set up as a government page, so we don't really uh, have to deal with that too much at all. Uh, we can post information, uh, comments, and – so forth that we've blocked since then, but we're really using it as an information, uh, just a one-way electronic bulletin board, essentially. So we don't really deal with that just because of the way we have the page set up. Uh, Neil, I know you've dealt with other agencies uh, when they have friends. Uh, have you ever heard of an issue where somebody's been unfriended and complained about it other than their feelings get hurt? <laughs> I have not heard of, of such an issue. As Sergeant Fulcher pointed out, um, ideally your agency is operating with a, a – with Facebook used to call it a business page, or now it's just a page, yeah. rather than a personal profile. And if you do have a personal profile, we have we have an article on our our blog that I'll be happy to share with you that explains how to convert that personal profile to a page. So that's step number one. Now, what you may be referring to is the, the notion of people liking you, uh, liking your page, and somehow 
um, you know, may, forcing them to unlike you. I'm not even sure if you can do that. So I've never really heard of an issue there. I, I don't. Um, fr from what I've heard, we, we do come across a lot of different concerns and, and areas of risk. That's that's an area where we haven't uh, really heard much happen in. Okay. And this one, hey, guys, we have a West Coast question. This one comes from Barbara Medina, San Diego County District. Um, uh, unless there, there's not a San Diego County in New Jersey, is there, Sarge? No, there's not. Okay, so it's West Coast. Hey, she asks, is it a good idea to disable the Facebook star reviews option? I mean, there's positive and negative reviews, but since they're part of a government organization, they don't think it's relevant to have as it would be for a business. Or does this trigger any First Amendment complaints? I know, Anil, uh, let's throw this out to you first. I know you've dealt with a lot of the features of Facebook. Any thoughts around that? It's a great question, Barbara. Um, so, so the review section on your page, you're absolutely right. There's this uh, both good and bad, and sometimes people that are just visiting your county may just use that as an opportunity to gripe before they leave, and it may not be even something for you to address. Um, so I, I would say that um, this is something that you need to address based on what you're seeing come in on, the, on that, um, that avenue on Facebook. We at Archive Social, we do archive those reviews in case you want to be able to, to enable those and have records of those. Um, we do find that citizens often have legitimate complaints or feedback for the agency, so it may be a good idea to keep it enabled. Um, and, and ultimately, um, if you choose to disable it, um, then generally the, the approach that we've seen taken is essentially you're not participating on that particular channel on Facebook. So it's not, a, not necessarily a First Amendment um, violation from, from our side. It's, some, it's somewhat similar to you not even – say, for example, you chose to not even participate on Facebook in the first place. Um, because you're not utilizing that channel of communication doesn't mean you're somehow clamping down on First Amendment. So you can turn off reviews, which means that people won't even have the option to post them in the first place. So I don't think you have an issue there from a First Amendment standpoint. Well, and uh, Barbara just uh, wrote back, she's from the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. Having spent many time at ICP conventions in the Gas Lab District, there better not be any pictures of me on Facebook because uh, what's supposed to happen in San Diego is supposed to stay there. So a uh, different time for a different day. Hey, we have a question here from uh, Walter Koch. Walter's with the Washington Township Police. And he actually asked a really good question, too. Uh, and, and, Sarge, let's start off with you with this because you were dealing with this to begin with. He said, why would people not just take screenshots of the things posted on the department's social media instead of filing Oprah requests? Taking their own screenshots, I, I guess he means? Yeah. I mean, have you dealt with it? Where, did you ever have a situation where somebody said, hey, I don't need to file, or you heard that they didn't file a request because they said they found everything from there? Or do you find out people are filing open requests because they can't find everything just simply by taking screenshots? Uh, kind of a combination of both. I think most of what we've seen is they aren't doing it on their own because they either can't find it, they're not sure what they're looking for, or the biggest reason in our case was that it wasn't there for them to take a screenshot of. And once we changed that setting so that we had to approve and that we weren't just automatically posting all of these comments and posts and everything, it wasn't there for them to grab. So that's why they started filing the OPA requests and why we started archiving it so we could produce it. Neil, and I know you've got some thoughts around this because we talk about what, what, even if they try and do screenshots, they are still missing the conversation and lots of data, aren't they? Uh, absolutely. And as Sergeant Fulcher said that, when, when this has happened, um, the concern is, is not that, okay, this content's out there and I don't want to just go get it myself. I'm going to ask the agency to produce it. It's generally people that are looking or asking you for content that they don't think is out there anymore or they think something's missing or they want the full, the full picture of, of every time you mention something. Um, and, and, and by public records law, because of retention requirements, um, there is a retention period, uh, there's retention schedules. So content shows up on your social media site for that retention period. You as an agency are, are, are responsible for responding to these OPA requests, for these public records requests. Now, you could schedule that content and say, okay, this content came in our site. Um, it's administrative value, therefore we're not going to be responsible for, for more than 90 days, or it's a citizen complaint, we're going to keep it for five years. And maybe after five years, you can say, okay, um, this request came in, um, but it's been five years since that content was, was there. We managed it for five years. Now it's not our problem. We don't have to respond. You can take that approach. Again, that, that's a little bit confusing, I think, for a lot of folks. Ultimately, citizens are going to come to you and they're going to ask you for it. And whether or not you absolutely have to produce it yourself or not, you're going to have to deal with this request. And so what a lot of agencies are figuring out is that if they just had a simple one, you know, turnkey solution for having the records as they use social media, it's much easier to respond to those requests. 
generally ha they have to anyway because it's a requirement. And even if they were out of the retention requirements because maybe it's not a, not a long-term record, it's easier just to produce that information than to fight the battle of, well, it's not my responsibility. You have to go produce it yourself. Yeah, and, and look, at the end of the day, it, the more time you spend doing that, you actually waste a lot of staff time, so it becomes very efficient. Um, and hopefully I don't get this name wrong. Darren Dockison. Uh, with the Madison Police Department, asked as a PBA page, and for some of you folks uh, out there that may not know, I know the folks in Jersey do, a police benevolent association, kind of like a fraternal order of police, a, you know, a membership organization. Does a PBA or a membership organization Facebook page fall under Oprah? Uh, Sarge, what has been your dealing with that uh, out there in New Jersey? Uh, I certainly don't want to be quoted. I'm, I'm not the, uh, the the crack legal team that would give you the official answer, I guess. I don't believe it is. These are normally the OPA request a res uh, result of government pages, uh, not private institutions or private pages. I don't believe we've seen user problems with anything like that. Um, ours, our PBA has their own. I believe they do. And there's been no request for that type of information that I'm aware of. Yeah, and like, yeah, I'm not, an, uh, I'm not the attorney, but I'd go out on a limb and say because they are not a government organization. They don't fall under the same things. Uh, Anil, have you ever Correct. run into a situation, though, where somebody confuses a uh, PBA page or a membership organization page with law enforcement or a government agency and tries to file an uh, open records request? I haven't, I haven't actually heard of a specific open requ records request uh, in that arena, but it is, it is, a, it is an area of confusion. Um, I think Sergeant Fulcher was right on when he said that it's, it's a private entity and therefore not subject. Now, there are some crossover situations where there are public-private partnerships uh, and, and essentially agency businesses being conducted, um, you know, often with tax, taxpayer funding. And those situations, we do see folks go ahead and archive the content. Again, it's a very, very easy, low-cost thing to do these days. Um, and to have that content, whether it's a public records request or not, you may be requested for it, and there may be legal situations around it. And it's, a, it's just a smarter position to be in to, to have the control of your own data to be able to produce it. So I think when, when there's some crossover, you should definitely consider it. But if it's clear that it's, it's a private entity, it's not based on taxpayer funds, then, then, you, then you're, you're in good shape and you don't need to worry about it. Yeah, and uh, this is going to be a quick answer uh, for you, Sarge, from uh, Michelle Everly of C County of Gloucester. Uh, do you allow posting on your Facebook page now? I think the answer to that is no. Is that still correct? That is correct. We still have everything turned off. Okay. Let's go to Ernie. Ernie Serino is in the Mercer County Sheriff's Office. Ernie would like to know, he says, we keep a manual log of inappropriate posts that are taken down from our Facebook site. It happens so very rarely. They, he wants to know, well, what are your thoughts? Uh, so, Anil, let's, uh, let's hop off. Let's, let's start with you and then go to the sergeant. Sure. Well, Ernie, that's a great way to get started. You absolutely um, need to have a record when you're moderating. I'm glad that your agency is already following that practice. Um, there are some downsides, again, to the screenshot approach, as we talked about. Um, but per perhaps the bigger issue is that when you take sc screenshots of what you're removing, you're only capturing a glim you know, a slice of, of, of the content that you may be losing. Just because you're, you're moderating um, doesn't mean you're the only one moderating or removing content. Where we're seeing a lot of uh, concern arise and where some issues are arising is where citizens may be providing information to you. It may, be, it may be simple as feedback, but it may be something like a crime tip. It may be a crime tip over a Twitter direct message. We've seen that happen. Uh, and then the citizen decides to retract that by deleting it. Um, citizens can delete the content they've shared with you, and you won't even know that they've, they've deleted it, and you've lost these records. Um, so it's very, very difficult, I think, to, to have, have a record of everything that's, that's being deleted, even if you're keeping your own slice of what you're moderating. Uh, and then on top of that, I think uh, Sergeant Fulcher touched on, um, it, it may not even, when you get a records request, what we've often seen with, with our case studies and our own customers is that oftentimes the records requests will involve content that you haven't, haven't, uh, haven't even moderated or deleted. Um, just the, the amount of time uh, and the difficulty of, of corralling that information together um, can put your agency at risk because you're likely to miss something. And so you want to have some kind of record keeping in place. Yep, and guys, folks, we have about a minute a left, minute and a half left, so we're going to try and bang out a couple more quick questions. Uh, and, Neil, this always comes up. Uh, Kamal Saleh, hopefully I got that right, Union County, he asks about how is the system populated, how is it tagged, but I think he also, I think the, the key thing I found in here, in terms of cost, what needs to be done to determine the cost for developing a system for an agency? And I know you've got a really good business model for this, so why don't we explain the cost real quick of Archive Social? 
Sure, absolutely. Um, the archive system being populated in terms of how does it get the data in the first place, that's, that's, that's a huge component of, of the value that we provide as a company because it's out there on Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube and Instagram. Um, it's effectively impossible for, an, for a single agency to go develop this technology themselves and maintain it um, as these social networks change. It's just not a, it's not a pragmatic choice. And so that part of what we do is we get that data in your control. Um, it's not just about storing data. It's actually getting it and dealing with it for you and the fact that these networks are changing. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of cost, um, most archiving solutions will run at least a few thousand dollars a year uh, and up. We at Archive Social have made a conscious decision to price this at a price point that's most often a discretionary spend. So more than 80% of our customers um, are less than 5,000 annual, and we picked that 5,000 mark because we know that's a mark where procurement can become more difficult. You may not be able to use the P card anymore. We want to make this a very, very easy spend for agencies that, that have the issue and need to solve the problem. And so, again, more than 80% of our customers are under 5,000 annual, and we do have pr price points below that, and we have price points above that as well based on your social media usage. Um, and once you do set up with us, it's a turnkey solution that most agencies have up and running in less than 30 minutes. Yeah, guys, we could go on with this real quick. This last one's for, uh, and I'm going to answer this real quickly for Samantha Robinson. She wants to know are there other case studies. Uh, she's with the health department. She's with Madison Health Department. I'm going to put Anil's um, information back here, so you can get a hold of Anil there. You can go to their company site, archivesocial.com, and make sure that you get that information. So what we'll do is, um, folks, we're going to have to wrap this up here. As much as I hate to do it, we still had several questions out there. Uh, but for Samantha, for you, uh, you can go to the page. They've got case studies there, and I know that Anil and his team have a lot more case studies than just law enforcement. Uh, so it's a great way to do it. So, hey, folks, first of all, what we want to do today is we want to thank our sponsor for this, which is Archive Social. Big thanks, Anil, to you and your team for putting this on. Um, want to be respectful of everybody's time, so we're going to close this out today. And a big thanks to Sergeant Christopher culture for coming on talking about Vineland talking about what you folks are doing a lot of different ways to do this and again you know folks what we want to do is say thank you there'll be a link going out here you can download the PDF of the slides right here right now um, we want to make sure that you guys share this with your colleagues thank you for joining us take a look at this govtech.com forward slash webinars it'll be available there share that with your friends any questions give me a shout I'll point you in the right direction so everybody we want to thank you today for being on and we look forward to seeing you again soon at another government technology event. Everybody have a great afternoon.